preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Helene Geismar Katz, and I'm director of the Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the 92nd Street Y. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth annual Rosenthal Lecture, endowed in memory of Mina W. and Harold L. Rosenthal. We are so pleased to have, us, have with us tonight John and Jackie Rosenthal, whose generosity made this night possible. John is chairman of the board of the 92nd Street Y, and Jackie is chairman of the wonderful benefit that will be held in this hall next Monday evening to ensure that all of the Y's programs continue. So we're pleased. I agree. So we're always pleased to have John and Jackie with us, but never more so than on this evening. It is also my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Our speaker was born in Zurich, son of physician parents who had fled Poland during the Holocaust. They came here to New York, where he attended the High School of Music and Art, graduating at the age of 16. He received his bachelor's degree with honors from the University of Chicago, and at the ripe old age of 24, while studying for his PhD in history at Harvard, he was hired as the president of Franconia College in New Hampshire. Well, that was in 1970. He did go on to finish that degree at Harvard, but not until 1985, because he had a few other things to accomplish in the meantime. In 1975, he became president of Bard College, a position he holds to this day, making him one of America's longest serving college presidents. The last 17 years have seen a rebirth at Bard. Applications have tripled, the standards have toughened, and students now come from far and wide to attend from over 45 countries. But Bard has retained its focus on the liberal arts and its belief in learning for learning's sake. And as much as our speaker believes in his students taking on new, ta new challenges, he believes in that for himself as well. And so it is that in 1992, he became editor of the Musical Quarterly and musical director of the American Symphony Orchestra. It is for good reason that the New York Times calls him the most happy college president. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Leon Botstein. Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank the 92nd Street Y, uh, where I first uh, was many years ago listening to the Budapest String Quartet, which uh, reveals my age, uh, if not my cultural prejudices, and the, um, and the Rosenthal family for endowing this lecture. Uh, the subject which um, I've been asked to talk about is the educational crisis. And uh, what I'd like to do is really, there are two parts to this talk, and then there will be questions afterwards. Uh, the first part is to talk a little bit about the context in which uh, we can talk about the educational crisis. And the context is really an opportunity. Uh, the first is that um, since the mid-1970s, there's been a fair amount of public discussion about the uh, declining quality of American education. Uh, the logic is very pretty simple, that uh, there is a kind of uh, notion that once upon a time the American school system worked, and that uh, something happened along the way. Uh, somewhere in the 60s, uh, conservatives will argue that it was the result of a rebellion on the American campuses and the triumph of a kind of uh, uh, soft-headed liberalism which crept into the training of American teachers and the general culture. Uh, but in any event, uh, by the mid-1970s, there was some general agreement that something was quite wrong with the functioning of the American school system and the standards of American education. Uh, the explanation clearly was based to some extent, not on a diagnosis of what was going on, but also some notion that once upon a time, 
the school system worked. We began to read uh, all kinds of things about uh, what kids used to be able to do once upon a time that they're no longer able to do. Read and write, compute, and various kinds of wonderful descriptions of what used to be the case. The most important, of course, uh, uh, 10 years ago, really, there was the important document, uh, the report that the Reagan administration put out on the issue of American schooling, uh, and this report uh, focused on the issue of mediocrity and uh, the problem that America faces in a competitive world, that its educational system simply doesn't do the job, and that there needs to be something done. And uh, ironically, both the Reagan administration and President Bush um, took on education as a major political issue. Here, of course, in the United States, uh, they faced um, a tradition of federal non-involvement. Uh, one of the interesting uh, issues, which I won't talk a lot about, is the fundamental economic structure of American education, which is still locally based in property tax and state aid without a major federal investment, except at the margins. And uh, we can debate it later, but there is no civilized country in the Western world where such a system of financing still holds. We are the prisoners of an 18th century calculation of wealth and its taxation, that is to say property as an indirect measure of uh, wealth accumulated and its taxation for education. It is a completely outmoded and archaic system of financing a modern educational system. And the difficulties inherent, not only inequalities in terms of neighborhoods, but also the uh, inability, really, uh, to create a first-class national system is part of the financing structure. The conservatives have always argued that there's a constitutional prohibition implicit uh, in federal investment or involvement in education. I don't see it, uh, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, I think it's a very convenient excuse. I think one can merge national financing with local control. But in short, uh, the Reagan administration was very long on raising the issue. Bill Bennett and other secretaries were very uh, adept uh, in the Reagan-Bush years in raising education as a public issue. But uh, primarily, it was uh, to exhort others, states, families, and others, to do the job that the government was not going to do. The opportunity we face now, of course, with a change of administration is presumably the Democrats uh, have come in with some kind of uh, agenda which should help education. I don't want to wax political because probably uh, push to the wall, uh, I would find uh, from a point of view of people interested in education, both parties wanting. And uh, I would say also that uh, the early days of the Clinton administration do not bode well uh, for a serious um, uh, investment in, uh, in trying to change the American educational crisis. But the opportunity is still there. The administration is young and hope springs eternal. And uh, after 12 years of a certain strategy, one would hope that serious consideration would be given to trying to change uh, our strategy uh, with respect to uh, American education. To put it uh, bluntly, uh, the situation is very critical. It has not gotten better, and it is getting worse. And uh, it has nothing to do whether once upon a time it worked. We'll come to the once upon a time argument, because it influences public policy very profoundly. Uh, to give my assumptions away from the start. I don't think it makes sense to try to argue uh, how we should fix American education by describing a mythic reality that once existed. Um, I would argue that if one looks at the historical record in the post-war period in the early 50s, American college educators bitterly complained about the quality of American schooling that uh, kids were coming out of high schools who couldn't really do college work. The same complaint was rife in the 1930s. The most important thing, which we'll come to in a moment, of course, is that even in the 50s and in the 30s, the percentage of American adolescents who finished high school was much lower than it is now, and that America only reached the 50% mark uh, of um, uh, young people graduating high school uh, in the 1940s. So you're talking about an entirely different sector of the population. And when people talk about SAT declines, I can make the counterfactual, the counterintuitive argument, not counterfactual, counterintuitive argument, that uh, we should be impressed by how little the SAT 
scores have declined given the widening, widening range of the population taking them. That is, as opposed to bemoaning the SAT decline uh, before understanding what it's about, I would argue that um, if you anticipated the massive democratization of the school systems in the 60s and 70s, one could have predicted a much more radical decline uh, in the SAT scoring. So it, it, it doesn't, I don't think, pay to to sort of re-enact the past, um, it rather one look, has to look at the proper standards for the present without um, imagining a past that never existed. We also imagine a time when there was no violence in the schools. It was a time when everybody was well behaved and uh, uh, that everybody learned and uh, nobody, uh, there were no truants and there was no um, disobedience. And uh, these are myths and historical myths which don't help us see clearly about what needs to be done now. The other opportunity for educational reform, I think now in the early 90s, is that the political situation which we face in terms of, of education has changed. Uh, first of all, this is a wonderful time to think about what we ought to be doing because at the end of the century, people become very reflective. Uh, we may not be superstitious, we may not have numerological fantasies, but as we reach the year 2000, everybody begins to think about the year 2000. And we begin to think of the 20th century and it's a historical period. And there's a fantasy cycle of our own, just as there was 100 years ago, and people become very self-conscious about this. And they say, well, where are we going and where are we coming from? It's a very wonderful opportunity to reflect clearly, or not so clearly, but at least interestingly, about what moment in time uh, we find ourselves in. And um, uh, this is a, a, a very powerful moment. It's going to get even more powerful uh, as we ne near that magic number 2000. So we talk about the 21st century and so forth and so on. The second is that there's been enormous political change uh, since the late 80s. The end of the Cold War and the absolutely decisive change economically and politically that America faces in the world in a so-called post-Cold War period uh, is, is very important. We cannot ignore uh, the issue of education uh, in terms of its political context. And what we do with education has a lot to do with the way we conceive not only the American uh, future, but also our place in the world. We are also in the midst of a very remarkable and important technological and scientific change. Uh, the biological revolution that has to do with uh, discovery of DNA and the development of new both uh, technologies and in information and in biology, that is in computer science and the biological sciences, will prove increasingly uh, to change the nature of our daily life. Uh, it's trivial. But once upon a time, uh, we thought about the evil of education being the, the television. Television occupies an enormous place in the common discourse about education. What's wrong with education? Well, television. Uh, well, if you consider, um, uh, because people watch television, they don't read, this, this co common analysis of how technology has influenced our daily life. Well, if you add the Xerox machine, the fax machine, the cellular telephone, uh, and um, God knows what else is around the corner, it's quite clear with the computer at the center of it that um, technological and scientific change influence the context in which we learn and we teach. And uh, we're just at the beginning stages, in my judgment, of that technological change. The fourth important point, of course, is the demographic change. And that is that uh, the nature of what is the American population is also before us, uh, that the ethnic and um, uh, social change that America faces internally is in a very important and crucial context in the way we consider education. The last context before getting to actually what we ought to do and what we, I think is wrong with American education, how we might fix it, um, arrogant as that uh, simple description might be, because everybody has his or her own idea of how to fix education, usually it's derived from their autobiography, what either went wrong or went right in their school system. When you hear people talk about education, you always know either they are nostalgic about what they experienced or they are still angry what they didn't get. And, uh, and now have made it into a philosophy of education. Uh, I will try to avoid doing that as best I can. Uh, and um, I have very little nostalgia about my own education. People always tell me I went to New York Public City Schools and how terrific they were and how lucky I was. I don't want to offend anybody here. They were terrible when I went to them. And uh, uh, I don't think they were ever any good. Uh, 
what, of course, is they functioned in an entirely different context, and therefore uh, certainly th certain things have gotten worse, I'm sure. Um, but um, I'm not sure how one discussed the comparison, but I don't think it's fair to say that they were terrific in any event. But the important political context, the final context before we get to the remedies or the diagnosis, is that we really are at the end of a, of a period. When you think about the year 2000, you think about the 20th century, the context in which education takes place has become very, very difficult, I would say. The first is young kids, whether they go to Head Start or elementary school or to high school or to college, are going now with some consistency to schools in a context in which the adult community believes the future will be worse than the present. Now, this seems to be irrelevant, but it really isn't. Now, the Times had an article about diminishing expectations about the economy. Diminishing expectations of the economy is not the issue. The issue is diminishing expectations about the quality of life. And this is inherently related to the idea of progress. What is different between the time I went to school and the time young kids are going to school now is that, for better or for worse, my parents believed and the world around me believed that the future would be better than the past. We live in a period where every child picks up an inherent pessimism in the adult community. Once upon a time, the city was clean. The subway was a dime. There was no crime. Everything was civilized. The world worked. And now it doesn't. Not only does it not work, it's going to get worse. And there is absolutely no expectation that it's going to get better. It is impossible to educate in a climate of complete cultural pessimism. If the message to every young person is, you should have been alive 30 years ago, <laughs> it's extremely hard to cultivate serious motivation. If you think this ship is sinking, whether the ship is America or the world or whatever ship you wish to design for yourself to be a member of, it's extremely hard to tell a young person to be energetic, well-behaved, disciplined, and wait about the future because education is the most archaic conception of time. It is only an education where we have the following message. Johnny or Susie, go to school. Be good for six years of elementary school, at a minimum. Daycare, we will eliminate for the upper middle class. Nursery school, eliminate. Start kindergarten. Okay, that's six years. Then continue to be good for another three years junior high school, another three years of high school, and then four years of college. That's 12 years, and then probably some graduate education. Then after a while, after 20 years, you'll see the reward. The amount of delayed gratification that is inherent in education made sense when the society thought in generational time. If we thought about our own lives and our own homes and our own context in terms of these large blocks of time, it would make sense. But these kids grow up in a world in which people change their jobs in matters of years, sometimes months, their relationships in matters of days, success in the workplace and the economy in matters of minutes in some cases, where there is no sense of permanence or any kind of generational time at all. Yet the child is in this 18th century clock. The clock of the school and the reward system of the school life is an 18th century clock, and we're living in a late 20th century clock, where there is no memory. You are a star yesterday, you're not a star tomorrow. There's absolutely no residue, no continuity. It's about fashion and style, and the child, therefore, has very little cultural incentive, whether the child, whatever ethnic group the child may be from, to believe that, in fact, being dutiful in this very slow clock, which is called education, will have a real reward, especially if you combine it with the cultural pessimism that the future is deteriorating as we speak. So the sooner I can make a hit and the sooner I can get out, the happier I'll be. The other context in which education derives from is something that is more problematic, and that is, uh, that is, we are reminded of it by the catastrophe that happened in Waco, Texas. 
Much of, in America particularly, schooling was based on a concept of progress which was tied to secularization. Uh, particularly in the period right after the Second World War, but already in the 40s and the 30s. And this had a lot to do also with the dream of communism and socialism. It was clearly that there were two things. There was superstition here, and there was reason and science there. And there was no doubt that the sort of Jeffersonian and founding father's dream of the separation of church and state made eminent sense. Religion was really, as the founding of the State of Israel also reflects, uh, was viewed to be a secular state. Ben-Gurion and Weizmann didn't think the rabbis would ever play a serious role. They threw them a bone. They never expected, nobody ever expected, the revival of religious sentiment to the extent we have now encountered. The process of secularization seemed permanent. The more we knew in science, the less we were compelled to believe in anything that was remotely like God and that whether it's Buber or Tillich or Barth, the great theologians of the mid-century tried to reconstruct a sense of faith and theology that avoided the traditional mystical, fundamentalist, religious options, each of them different. Fact remains is that secularization has collapsed totally in our own country and in the world. That it is no longer the case that we can say that, well, the people who died in the, in the conflagration in, in, in Waco were other kinds of people. No, they are in the extreme of a continuum which is in the center of our own society. Uh, in the third act of Mussorgsky's Chovanshina, the old believers immolate themselves. Uh, this is not uh, too dissimilar. The fanaticism, which we would call fanaticism, is fanaticism only from the point of view of a devout secularist. Fact is that religion the revival of religion, the desire for people to have some meaning in their life that is not from merely the tradition of reason, rationality, and a common discourse of science, the desire to form some kind of meaning for their lives out of a religious tradition that often is intolerant, from a secularist point of view, superstitious, and at odds with learning, is uh, this revival is something no one anticipated and influences school politics enormously, not only in reading lists, but in the general attitude to school in the first place. So we live in a time where the role of reason and the role of the basic presumptions of a common school system, science, learning, truth, have been challenged, the idea of truth. I uh, heard recently from one of my colleagues uh, the newest a phrase, which is called standpoint epistemology. Now, this fancy word, I'm trivializing it intentionally, is simply a fancy academic theory that whatever point of view you hold, it's true. <laughs> now, this notion is there is clearly no truth out there. There's no common ground whatsoever. In the absence of a common ground, the way I see it, if I see the world is flat, it's not that I'm wrong. That is to say, it's perfectly valid from my point of view. Now, there's no doubt that the world is flat functionally. I don't walk around nervous that I'm going to slip off the edge of the earth. And it, there certainly is, I can understand from an from a epistemological point of view, it's perfectly reasonable to say that, in fact, the earth is de facto flat and that I have to go to a lot of counterintuitive experiments to prove to myself that it is really not flat, but that it is round means also, therefore, that the phrase, the earth is flat, is in some limited sense a true statement. That I act as if it's flat. Unless I'm involved in some very elaborate aerospace dynamics, then I hope I know better than to assume it's flat. But for the ordinary person, it's kind of Aristotelian view of the world and doesn't bother with truth. I, I don't know, measure, the cop doesn't do a relativistic mechanical calculation on my speeding. Uh, uh, they do a Newtonian mechanical explanation of my speeding and give me a ticket. And um, I don't give them an answer saying, well, from a, your frame of reference, really, I'm not going 30 miles an hour. Uh, we don't engage in this kind of discourse. We assume the approximation is all right. Now, the reason I bring this up is because uh, there is some hidden truth in this standpoint of epistemology, but it's gone to an extreme that is, uh, goes at the heart of any educational system. If there is no common ground, uh, the only common ground perhaps left is science. Uh, 
and mathematics, but certainly in the other areas where we're concerned about reading and writing and history, there's no common ground Then what I teach you is in a form of oppression. It's not a form of, of introduction to a common truth. The names carved on this wall, uh, because this is a Jewish organization primarily, there are very few Jews as I remember, but um, <laughs> it's an interesting that, uh, that if I were really, seriously, I would say that the people who built this were really uh, assimilationists, and uh, probably uh, inherently anti-Semitic. Why are there only Jews on this wall? Um, and uh, not only that, but I would also say that, uh, that um, but the, the premise of the builders of this hall, that actually there was a common fund of knowledge and learning, which uh, nations, Moses Mendelssohn's notion, that in fact you could merge uh, the tradition of Christianity and Judaism in some way to have an enlightened relationship of secular and religious knowledge and so forth and so on. These kinds of dreams are based on some premise of common ground, whether it's linguistic or epistemological, however you want to phrase it. Those notions are at uh, much, at, they are not held. Uh, that is to say, therefore, if, whether it's literature or history, I'm therefore imposing my subjective point of view on you. That makes education very difficult. It renders every educational scheme profoundly political and in some cases oppressive. Now, in mathematics and science, which is the good news, it's very hard. I have yet to hear somebody about to be given a heart transplant saying, uh, uh, is it Eurocentric medicine you're about to practice or um, just plain medicine? And I've never been in the many travels, never gone on an airplane where I had the choice of having the, the sort of local cultural airplane and the international airplane in which I went in, in, uh, in Chinese aerodynamics as opposed to simply universal aerodynamics. And um, uh, the, uh, the universality of DNA and the basic biological uh, uh, interchangeability of our species ought to give some pause to this radical subjectivist notion of uh, how we view issues of truth and commonality. But that makes, as intellectual background, the creation of a, of a, of a um, of an educational policy very hard. It's nothing against diversity. I'm much in favor of diversity. But diversity has to have a context itself, not an argument. And uh, that, that context is very hard to get agreement upon. The other context, of course, uh, that's very important for educational policy is the notion of identity. Um, once upon a time, their notion was that uh, what was interesting about the American idea of education which is related to American democracy, is that uh, there was a regional, certainly, uh, identity. There was a religious identity. But there was some notion that citizenship was a kind of uniform cloak. And that has been taken aside, since our faith in democracy is quite limited. And we've assumed other kinds of identities, essentialist, ethnic, religious, particularly. And this is true not only in the United States, but around the world. Therefore, people don't consider themselves individuals. They consider themselves reflective of an either ethnic group or uh, some kind of unity. People solve the question, who am I, by saying, well, I'm Jewish. Well, any Jewish historian will tell you that tells you very little. Uh, that I'm a Jewish white male is probably significant in some way, but it tells you very little. It's not a predictive result of saying how I think. That I may be a Mexican-American uh, may not tell me very much, but in order to solve the ambiguity, we have reduced these identities, whether it be gender or ethnicity, to be predictive of the way we think, on the assumption that there's a kind of uniform autobiographical or cultural inheritance, which therefore defines these units. Yugoslavia is the worst example of this. Now, this way of solving the question of who am I makes education very difficult also, because it makes the options for individual transformation very hard. You can't simply get out of the hole you've been put in by your birth, which is, of course, very much against the notion of how education ought to function, or the dream, or the myth, however you want to call it, how education ought to function in a society that is open, that's not feudal, that is not an English caste structure, or, so, or, or as rigidly put together as some other societies. That is, as theoretically open-ended, theoretically open-ended as the American society. Likewise, the issue of equality, which is the key question in education, is uh, the notion of equality is very much uh, now under review. On the one hand, people say, well, there is no equality. It's, uh, people have prejudiced views about racial differences and so forth and so on. Uh, but the theoretical political notion of equality that Locke first put forward uh, in our tradition that was part of our 
democratic heritage is that people are uh, created equal. Well, that's a theological statement. It is also a statement of some psychological assumptions that babies are born and they are creatures of their environment, associationist theories that Locke first put forward, the tabula rasa, the blank slate, upon which one sort of intervenes with social intervention, and social engineering, one changes their character, improves them, and where therefore one can make rapid changes in social progress, again to the idea of progress. What's interesting, of course, is that equality was about blankness, nullity, emptiness. And therefore, one filled it, uh, to some extent, by uh, very kinds of enterprises, such as the common school, in which, therefore, you could train people to become citizens. You could, the communists were very high on this, uh, pulling people out of the families, the kibbutzim. There are various experiments which are based on this notion of the malleability of the human species. Well, we don't particularly share this notion of malleability anymore. And with that, we have conceded the basic premise although no one has proved this to be wrong, of equality. And once we give up the basic premise of equality, we are in trouble in trying to create a common school system. So we are really in a very dangerous moment, in my judgment, intellectually, in which to talk about uh, schooling in a democracy where there's an integral relationship between school and democracy. The 18th century founders of this nation, uh, Jefferson particularly, but their intellectual uh, models, Hume, for example, believed absolutely that education was a key to progress, believed in this malleability, believed that one could appeal to the rational faculties of people and create essentially a better world rapidly through a social improvement. Horace Mann believed that. It was a basic premise and hopefulness of America. Now, interestingly, that when this shared optimism came apart is when access to American education became really widespread. That is to say, it was all right as a theory when most Americans never finished high school. But when really Americans in large numbers equally, that is not equally in what they learned, but certainly had greater access, increasing access, not only to high school, but to college, uh, people began to worry about whether the system could work. In other words, the real challenge America puts forward, which is why comparisons with England, or with Japan or Germany are nonsensical in my judgment, absolutely nonsensical, not only because the societies are different, because it's non-transferable, is the notion that you can reconcile equity with excellence, that actually you can have a democratic educational system, truly democratic educational system, and come out with a good result. And with all the nostalgic talking about what used to be the case, we didn't have a democratic educational system. We've never tried this experiment. It's much premature to call the experiment as a failure. The experiment was only possible beginning in the late 60s, and as soon as it began, people were abandoning ship, declaring its failure. As the Reagan administration would argue, the compensatory education never worked, was never really tried in a serious way. The nation has never put the proper investment in education that is required. The task has been grotesquely underestimated. And we won't talk about efficiency for a moment, one cannot lodge or ask of American education an efficiency we ask in no other part of our lives. We should tolerate the same inefficiency in American education we tolerate in General Motors. If that's the standard, it deserves a lot more funding than it's receiving now. So it seems to me cruel to expect that throwing money at the problem is not going to solve it. Starving the problem is not going to solve it either. And the fact is, throwing money at the problem, certainly the efficiency of the money thrown could be better. But is that the first question to be asked? No. Now, the other things, of course, which come closer to the question of education are the sort of context in which we would try to make educational reforms. Let's talk about language, literacy. The key instrument in our tradition of education is language, literacy, the use of language. Fact remains that, uh, Increasingly, maybe this has to do with technology, Xerox machines, well, I don't know, I'm not an expert in this area. Our definition of literacy has changed dramatically. First of all, we consider someone literate who can read, and not necessarily someone who can write. There's been a separation of reading and writing in the curriculum, a very dramatic one. So therefore, the passive recognition of the symbols is sufficient, when in fact, literacy requires active use of those symbols. But the point is, it's not that this stuff isn't taught. Is grammar taught in the American school? Sure, it's taught over and over and over again. The real issue is it's not remembered. 
The reason it's not remembered is because it's like teaching someone the rules of baseball when they've never been on a baseball field or any field at all. No child will remember the rules of baseball who doesn't play baseball. You don't show the child the book of baseball and its rules, examine them continuously when they have never either the desire or the opportunity to play. The first time a kid hits the ball and runs the third base and is thrown out, the child will never forget that particular rule of baseball. And when the first time the child doesn't put a foot on the base and it doesn't count, he'll never repeat or she will never repeat that accident. What I'm suggesting is that if you look in the uses of language in our society, it's no wonder that people don't read and don't write, and there's no motivation in the school. The school is, has deteriorated to the way in which it used to be. People sent their children to either Hebrew school or to a shul on Saturday or Sunday to a church while they slept in. What percent of American families read and not professionally, for fun. Well, the New York Times did a survey last Sunday. You may have seen it on leisure time use. And the maximum on any day that the American you read for fun was about 6%. If you consider their waking day, right? Eliminating moving one's bowels and all the usual uh, necessary events, eating and so forth and so on, which, didn't, which is not listed as a leisure activity except going out to eat, I think it was, and sleeping, you come to an approximately 10 hours of usable time. 6% of 10 hours of usable time it is not what I would call reading. Figure out what 6% of usable time is. It is 10% would be one hour, right? Now 6% would be something less than an hour, which is pitifully little reading. Most days it was 4%. Now, if you consider how many days it would require, or months would require to read War and Peace, with that kind of allocation of time, points out that in the American household in which our kids grow up, reading is not a function, except for people who are paid to read. My mother is a journalist. My mother is a professor. A child will say, they read, but they're paid to read. Is there anybody out there reading who isn't paid to read? And that counts reading the newspaper, by the way, which hardly constitutes grounds for serious literacy. <laughs> so in point of fact, we're a society that doesn't read. Why do we expect our children to read? We don't write for fun. In fact, the relative we write is the relative we don't want to see. <laughs> the person we do want to see, we call on the telephone or we visit. So our mobility is at odds. We write letters to things we avoid, condolence letters, Dear John letters. Bills, Dunning, and then we hire, the most of the letters we get, we hire people to do them, they're lawyers. They sue us, threaten us. So the mail carries bad news, the telephone carries good news. Cowardice is expressed in writing, and courage in person. Now in a society like that, how do you expect a young person to think, well, I need to really be literate? Very few people successful in the world are literate in their eyes, except professionals, mandarins, academicians. And there's a professionalization of culture, which has allowed many an intelligent student to say, I have to do well in school, but that has nothing to do with my actually thinking. School is a game which I have to get through, and once I'm finished with the game, I can shut it off. Memory. Essential for learning is memory. We live in a culture where memory is not essential. We don't have to remember anything. We can Xerox it. We can always retrieve it in a computer. The amount of stuff we have to retain in our own head, independent of any reference material, is limited. When one thinks that Thucydides wrote the entire Peloponnesian War without a reference system, is amazing. And we never repeated himself. Quality of memory is eroded. No one needs to have it. And in many cases, it's better that one doesn't have it. Likewise, curiosity. Given the cultural context I've just described, curiosity is limited. The more hostility there is between and among people, the less curious one becomes about them. The more frightening knowing something about the other is. Now, 
Given this cheerful description of the context in which we need to educate, I'm just pointing out that failure to educate is not the result of some evil people, bad policymakers, lousy teachers, uh, you know, ethnic groups we don't like who've come into our system, all kind of closet and overt racist comments about what really is going on in this city or any other city. Those, there are no culprits here. The problems are very, very major, very severe, and very basic. Clearly, however, uh, education remains, in my judgment, at the heart of any hope for democracy or any kind of quality of life, however you wish to describe it in this society. Well, how do we go about it? First of all, let me start with a piece of evidence. Now we get to the prescriptive part, a piece of evidence. Uh, you've all heard about the SAT scores. I don't believe in the SAT scores, and the SAT examination, one of the stupidest things ever invented. Parenthetically, why is it a stupid thing to invent? And one of the things we have to change is the way we test and measure. Nothing in life is a multiple choice test, nothing. You don't get out of any school, you don't go to your first job and the boss, she says, I have the following project, and then takes out five choices, choose one. <laughs> Nobody, whether it's in advertising or in government, operates with pre-existing, pre-digested choices. Just as what's wrong with E.D. Hirsch's cultural literacy is because if you know the answer, why worry about it? If it's all one word answers, why study anything if it's all simplified? The Battle of Waterloo took place in a certain date. It doesn't tell you why you should be interested in the Battle of Waterloo. That's not cultural literacy. Nothing about cultural literacy. It's about thinking. Well, the same thing is, of course, the multiple choice test. Also, a multiple choice test doesn't test approximation. First of all, you never get the answer back, so you don't know why you got it wrong or right, which, which vitiates any notion of testing at all. Testing is very important, very important, as a mode of teaching. It tests what you actually do know and retain. The moment you have to get the reward, see you got it wrong, and then you have to tell them why they got it wrong. And testing in multiple choice does not honor approximation. Take the following example. Who was president of the United States when Pearl Harbor was bombed? Five choices. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr., Harry S. Truman, Woodrow Wilson, George Washington. The fact is a person who says FDR has it right. The person who says FDR Jr. has a lot right. They may be insecure and think, well, maybe he was a junior. What do I know? They know a great deal, which is easily corrected. They have the right name. And they also have a lot. Harry Truman, they have an enormous amount of knowledge. They have the right war. They have the right decade. And if you ask someone when Socrates lived and you said the fifth century, they would give you a Nobel Prize. So the farther we, we are from the time, the more time seems appropriate. You get a dynasty in Chinese history right within a massive order of magnitude, you're considered highly educated. So getting Harry Truman is close, and that approximation is very valuable, and you need to encourage the young person or the old person to build on that approximation, the correction is very minor. Woodrow Wilson is pretty good too, the right century, most of the right combatants, a world war, <laughs> a world war, and this close, it's rescuable. The George Washington is, is, is problematic, I doubt. <laughs> now, this is not because I'm some soft-headed, you know, a child of the 60s with a proverbial flower in my teeth. The fact is that approximation is very, very, this kind of knowledge is very important, very important, as we try to give people the incentive and motivation to improve what they know or to be curious. So the whole multiple choice test is a nonsense. But, it is a standard measure. It's been around a long time. The most important thing about the SAT, you've heard about the decline, the decline of SAT scores, the decline of SAT scores. Well, the good news is they haven't declined very much for a long time. Since 1972, in the last 20 years, the decline of the SAT scores has been very marginal, if you count the average. The English is something in the 420s, and the math is in the 470s, and it's hovered around there for a long time. The real issue is that in 1972, there were 100,000 fewer test takers of the SAT, verbal SAT. And 116,000, about 11, I think, 12% of the takers scored over 600. There are 100,000 more takers. Although the average has not declined significantly, the number of people scoring over 600 is only 76,000. Second point of information. Whatever the reading score tests in New York City school systems are, 
they're interesting, but not as interesting as the National assess, uh, Assessment of Educational Progress it's done, which shows that reasoning skills, reasoning skills, show no gain at all. In other words, you can teach people to read, quote, by rote, but if they don't use it to think, the result is useless. Universal literacy in totalitarian countries didn't result in the creation of freedom, but the success of propaganda. The fact that all Germans under Nazi Hitler were literate didn't give them the autonomous tools to pierce the lies. Literacy is itself has to be connected to the use of literacy. And the reasoning scores by the measurements have not improved and declined. What do, what do people do with language? Now what to do? Apart from not trying to solve this matter nostalgically, a very famous educator once gave a speech where she described her teacher when she was a kid in Texas who diagrammed sentences. Now, in a world in which language functioned differently, where people had to use and command language in order to survive economically, where, in fact, literacy was, was experienced by the young person as an essential part of home and daily life, then maybe such a strategy is important. But what's important in the American school is not what's taught, but what's learned, and how it's taught in relation to what can be remembered and used. The story I told about the SATs is important for the following reason. Educational policy must, first of all, accept the democratic present premise that there is no conflict between equity and excellence. The Reagan years had the following logic. They basically said, listen, government intervention is a waste of time. Them that can will, them that can't won't. And them that can will are either people who are, quote, naturally gifted, whatever that means, or people have the right family structure as if the immigrant populations among the Jews even, or the Irish or the Italians, where Mama and Papa did homework with Johnny and Susie. Of course, this is a historical myth. Mommy and Daddy were working in sweatshops and often were illiterate, couldn't help Johnny and Susie with it at all. And if they were illiterate, not in the language. So this myth of the, of the sort of Central American myth of the two family, two person family, nuclear family, where with the run spot run with the dog and, and uh, mommy and daddy helping the kitty with the homework is, is a myth which was perpetrated to excuse the absence of any federal policy of any importance. The family was a really the root of education. The schools really couldn't do a difference. I don't believe this to be, there's no evidence that that's the case. When I say there's no conflict between equity and excellence, think of it as distribution of population. All of you know that there is something called, something like a bell-shaped curve. Whatever standard you apply to any mass population, the people on the high end and the low end, and a lot of people in the middle, a bulge. The task in American education is to move the entire population upwards on a scale of educational achievement. You follow? Therefore, the task is not to do something which is counterintuitive, make everybody excellent. No matter what standard you apply, there'll be a distribution. The question, however, is where does the population rest on a scale of educational measurement? Reading skills, math skills, whatever you want. The task is to push the entire population upwards. Why? The SAT statistic I gave you is indication of what's happening in American education, which is the average remains pretty stable, but what's happening at the ends is what's really critical. The definition of excellence is eroding, and the standard at the very bottom is deteriorating rapidly. Our task, and what the Clinton administration must do, is an educational policy which focuses as if on a snake, on the head and the tail of the snake, pulling the head forward and pushing the bottom up. The real emphasis investment has to be at the extremes. Consider it a race. We in America have one cultural phenomenon which is very important. Everybody is conscious of his or her peer group. It's particularly group psychology is an American triumph or disaster, however you look at it. We see ourselves in the way of other people see us. We define the other people as our age group, our peer group, especially when we hit adolescence, which is the most difficult time in American education. Think of it as a race. 
If the fastest person in the race races faster and the slowest person races faster, the middle will also race faster. People are bounded by the context we're in. If you can get an A for spelling dog, there's no reason to spell establishment. But if in order to pass you have to be able to spell dog, then the person who's going to be very high on the end will spell establishment. The context is crucial, which means you must raise the minimum standard if you want the upper standard to be raised too. If the kids who go to MIT, and Princeton, and Harvard, or Bard, or not, aren't as good as I remember them to be 20 years ago, to solve that problem, you must pay attention to the disadvantaged inner city kid. Because the culture is a uniform culture in that sense. The standards that work in civility and learning as the minimum standards influence the effort put in by those with the chance, either socially or otherwise, to do the highest quality work. Therefore, the social policy must be at the ends of the distribution of population in an effort to push the entire, not to play to the average, to the center. Very important, of course, is that uh, when we look at that strategy, we also have to recognize that one has to be very careful to avoid an implicit racism in educational policy. And implicit racism is to say, well, there are certain groups that did well and others did not do well. The point is the social context is crucial, whether it's poverty or a long heritage of dealing with racism. The reality is the involuntary minorities, the descendants of the American slave, African American, the Native American Indian, are two populations where a particular and massive special effort has to be put in in order to improve the results, and that to compare them to voluntary minorities, that is to say minorities that uh, come from voluntarily, not by slaves or not descended by slaves, is a comparison which is entirely unfair and remains unfair and invidious in not the right way. So what to do now? If we were, collective I were, in charge and had no democratic political policy to convince. We should start school earlier, not a kindergarten, but uniformly, universally earlier. That has to do also with biology. The fact is kids develop much earlier, and the general state of health, despite the evils of American medicine and the inequalities, are such that you could probably start formal schooling earlier with good results. Obviously, throughout the curriculum, one would simplify the curriculum and focus on very basic things. And those basic things are obviously command of language, reading and writing, uh, command of mathematical reasoning. Too much time is spent in the elementary school in repetition of arithmetic, We're talking about approximation, geometry, a much more enriched and much more successful uh, elementary school math curriculum. And a lot of people are working on this. A lot of what I'm saying is going on in various places. A lot of it is not new. It's not intended to be new. I would eliminate, end, destroy the American high school put it out of business. You would divide the schooling years into five years of elementary school or six years and a middle school. And at age, what now is the end of the sophomore year of high school, feed kids into the community college system. The American high school system has run its course. It is both structurally in its design, not congruent with the rapid development and autonomy of adolescence, the age of menstruation, physical maturation, and the independence which the society permits the adolescent. It simply does not work. The community college system, however, works very well by comparison. And it is doing now what the high schools should be doing. So send the kids to community college, the two-year college system early, two years early. And that's where you save your money. Abandon the traditional high school structure, which was a 19th century structure. It doesn't work anymore. Forget it. And therefore, you start earlier and you end formal compulsory schooling earlier in the career of the young person and plug in directly into what is relatively a quite a successful sector and a relatively new one where there's much more treatment of the young person as an adult and much more autonomy and a much more successful educational system with by and large better personnel with a greater incentive. That's why I think it is idiotic for my colleagues to argue that college ought to be three years, not because I'm a college educator, but that's one of the few places that still works reasonably well. 
And the fact is that it is the college, not the private liberal arts sector necessarily, that it's at stake. The community college, as well as the four-year liberal arts college, that needs to be started earlier. So you drop the access to serious education in terms of the age access. Europeans have done this for a long time for college bound. The gymnasium and the serious British secondary schooling are examples of how young people can adapt very well to a much more serious schooling system than now exists in the American high school. American high school is not fixable in its current design. So I would expand the community college system and reduce the number of years. Too many Americans spend too many years in schooling with too little to show for it. You could create greater efficiency by the number of years you put in. And with national service ideas, it's integratable very well at the end or in the middle. Uh, I think you have to uh, face the fact, we have to face a, na a nation, that teaching has to become a desirable profession. In order to make teaching a desirable profession, you not only have to raise the salaries. Long ago, I had the idea of making all public school teaching exempt from federal taxes which would be an easy way without a bureaucracy to improve the, the incomes of teachers. But in addition, you have to change the conditions of work. Why do many people want to become college teachers and not high school teachers? Not because it, the pay is that much better. In fact, a lot of public school teaching pays better than some college teaching. Why do good people teach in private schools even and not in public schools? Because the bureaucratization of the teaching profession, the absence of treatment of the teacher as a professional, the enormous regulation, the conditions of work which are horrendous, the absence of a real professional community, these things are quite, quite, um, um, they're disincentives. And socially, teaching has always been a, a transition profession. I've rarely been to a christening, to a bris, or whatever event you want to wear, the parents say, I hope he grows up into an elementary school teacher. Teachers hope for their children another profession. The fact remains is that there are too many lawyers, that's another matter, but there are not too many teachers. There is an insufficient number of teachers, class size ratio has to be reduced. It's impossible to do the inner city to do a good job with the kind of class size we have now and the way the time of the day is organized. The time of the day the school is organized in part is an economic necessity. It's an efficiency because there are insufficient numbers of adults in the position of teaching that has to be put and that has to be changed. The people who go into teaching now, there's some improvement, but it's very, very marginal. There's some increase in idealism. There's Teach America program. There's some very wonderful initiatives. We've brought young people into it. But by and large, even if they're idealists to start with, it's beaten out of them very rapidly. The administration and organization of schools needs radical changing. I would abolish the teacher education programs that are on the undergraduate level, and I would essentially dismember on the university campus schools of education. Teacher training therefore, has to be changed. It has to be located into subject matter and not pedagogy. The only area of pedagogy should remain intact is in the early childhood arena, where it's a serious discipline. But beyond that, the methods and materials of teaching have to be connected far more with the discipline. Love of subject, not a love of age group, has to predominate in the teacher. And that has to do with changing the integration of American schools and universities. America is excessively organized on a horizontal system. The teacher of a fourth grader knows more about the teacher of a fourth grader, even though the discipline is different, or a high school teacher of physics is more in touch with a high school teacher of math than she or he is in touch with a college teacher of physics. There should be much more of a vertical integration by field. The people who teach English in the elementary school and the high school should have more contact with universities, and likewise, the university should have more contact with the people in the lower grades. There should be more of a discipline-based orientation in the teacher training system. In terms of national service, every graduate school student in the nation should serve in the public school system as part of their graduate training, every single one of them. If they're not adept to teach, they can help out in a lab. They can do tutoring. They don't have to be Demosthenes. Uh, they have to, however, serve to help the school system. You need national standards, but the national standards cannot be driven by the testing instruments we have now. It would be a catastrophe. We test over test already without any result. We drive curriculum through testing. We create excessive uniformities. The testing instruments, as I described, are not helpful. They're particularly not helpful they're helpful for politicians and legislators and for the public and for journalists. They're not helpful for the kids who should benefit from the testing in the first place. 
Science and mathematics should be from the beginning at the center of the curriculum, as opposed to the humanities. This radical position I take is for the following reason. It's the last common ground we have, and it's the easiest curiosity to sustain. Every child wants to know about how the world works. And there's more to find out about how the world works than we can possibly handle. And every scientist in the history of the West, certainly, has been literate. That is to say, not as literate as we might like in the modern day, but there's no doubt that literacy in the use of common language is crucial to the transmission of the knowledge of science. Teaching of mathematics can be enhanced by the use of language. From the very beginning, we have to make that discovery, and that's where the progressive heritage was absolutely right, uh, that the continuation of a serious curiosity in the natural world and the explanation of the natural world is absolutely without uh, peer as a motiv motivational force. In addition, college is too late to develop interest in science and mathematics. It can only be done early in life. And therefore, the conceit of colleges that will fix it when you come here as a freshman can be done in lots of areas. It can be done in foreign language. A lot of immigrants speak very well. Nabokov did very well. Uh, but the point is that uh, he didn't become a rocket scientist. Uh, therefore, at age 18, starting with mathematics is too late. And age 18, starting with serious science, is perhaps also a little bit late. In order to help, you need to have a massive amount of in-service training for current teachers. In the urban area, I would suggest that we rethink the settlement house model, creating a new kind of physical space, which is the public school, which is open 24 hours a day, which is a safe haven of drugs and violence, where any young person can enter with an identification card. And he or she can get instruction and activities 24 hours a day. If there's not a sufficient family support system, they can walk in, creating essentially parks in the inner city with multiple kinds of facilities, which are education around the clock, 12 months a year. Now the question is, in higher education to close, many of you are interested, I would argue that uh, the central skill, whether it's in science or not, in the school needs to be the command of language. And there I would say that, uh, uh, for those of you interested in the subject, that uh, in the college world, uh, as in the elementary and secondary world, the um, love of learning is at the center of this. The motivational question is at the center of a successful education system. And that motivational uh, role is two. One is in the public arena and in the private arena. In the public arena, we need to make a connection between literacy and learning and the quality of our public life. That has to do with the discourse of politics. And the, the irony is that the quality of political discourse in the United States has declined, even though the number of people who finished college has increased. That is a we, and are not, when people say there used to be a great college curriculum once upon a time, I don't want to offend anybody in this room, but every alumni reunion I go to disabuses me of this fact. Uh, if people had a wonderful course in Western civilization, why do they behave so vulgarly 20 years later and think they're educated? Uh, I preferred the great-grandparents who never went to school and were very admiring of that which they had not access to. Now, the point I'm making is that you have to measure the quality of education between college education over the long run, not after when they graduate, but 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out, in the level of their curiosity, in the way they conduct their lives, how participant they are in their community, and what kind of role they, what kind of character of life they ascribe to a kind of educational experience they had in the very formative years of 18 to 22. And there, that's the way you measure a curriculum in the generation of curiosity and skills and interests. Therefore, I believe clearly in a core curriculum, but that core curriculum has to include diverse cultures, can't have an argument, is it Western civilization or is it African civilization? The fact is, for an American in the late 20th century, it is Western civilization and African civilization and Chinese civilization. Arthur Schlesinger is worried about this uniting of America, but the fact is, all the people say, what is an educated person? Give them a real test in Chinese or Indian history and they'll flunk right away. They won't even know who Thomas Jefferson, the moral equivalent of Thomas Jefferson is or was. The point being that we do live, whether we like it or not, cliches notwithstanding, in a global society, and we have to educate young people for that. So the diversity, the sort of nonsense that has been written about sort of multiculturalism is a very commonsensical notion, which is it's additive, it's not subtracted from the agenda of American higher education. 
A lot of it could be accomplished earlier, but in the face of the fact that it's not, it has to be done in college. And all curricula have been political. All curricula have been political from the very beginning. Once upon a time, the classics for the 18th century founding fathers were the Romans. By the late 19th century, early 20th century, the Romans vanished. What now goes for a real classical curriculum is Homer, not Virgil. Thucydides, not Livy. And Cicero, not Cicero, and, but rather Plato. What I'm pointing out is that our definition of the tradition always evolves and always changes. The in integration of Catholics and Jews into the American university system accelerated the dechristianizing of the curriculum, the elimination of required Bible and various religious courses. Curricula have always adjusted to political needs and political beliefs. In the 1930s, the reforms of the conservatives and also people like Hutchins were directly in response to what they viewed to be the threat of communism and fascism. What kind of curriculum can we put that will teach Americans to really function well in a democracy? The Harvard curriculum after the Second World War, Education for a Free Society, was clearly written in the context of developing in the Harvard undergraduate a serious response to the realities of the atomic age and the Cold War. The first general education curriculum of Nicholas Murray Butler time at Columbia University was in direct relationship to trying to create a world where war would no longer happen in the aftermath of the First World War. The question for us is not whether a political curriculum is political, but what politics do we want the curriculum to enhance? Is it a politics of commonality or a politics of fragmentation? Is it a, poli is it a politics where we have some common ground or do we not? So the issue is, by including diverse cultures, we enhance, do not decrease, the possibility of communication across ethnic and religious lines. I want to close, I've spoken too long already, that the key to educational reform is, first of all, decisiveness on the federal side, which is not yet in evidence, and a real mobilization of the nation to invest in it. Without it, the country is in deep trouble, not because it was once good, but it has never been right. And there's a really unique chance to fix it, particularly since the disenfranchised part of our population has now some reasonable expectation of access to the educational system, and our entire society depends on it more than ever before. Unskilled labor is not useful, and the relation of education and the economy, and the relation of education and democracy particularly, has not lessened, it's only strengthened. We have to struggle with our own sense of pessimism as adults, which we can hardly deny, and create an environment which is much more an environment of hope. I want to close with this notion of hope, not because I'm a preacher, but because there's a linguistic trick in it. As you know, one of the most ugly changes in grammar that has taken over the 20th century is the use of the word hopefully. For those of you who know anything about grammar, hopefully is an adverb and therefore, it is properly used as someone who, uh, uh, he is singing hopefully, which one might be say that they are hoping that they're in the right place. It modifies a verb. It is, however, used in common parlance as a surrogate for the word I hope. Hopefully, this guy will be finished talking. Right? That sounds correct to you. President of the United States says it. Hopefully, we'll have a better economy next year. Now, why has that been accepted to our ears? Why grammar, language evolves. Grammar is never fixed. It evolves by usage. Why has that usage become successful? I would argue it's become successful. It's because it fits absolutely the underlying cultural value of the shift, which is putting responsibility to the side. If you say, hopefully, he'll be finished soon. If you said correctly, I hope, the next thing we'd say, well, maybe you'll do something about it. Get up and say, sit down. If you said the economy, hopefully the economy will be better, it means hopefully deus ex machina, somehow it will be better. But not, I don't have to do it. If I say, I hope, I put the spotlight on myself, and therefore I have some responsibility. So the corruption of the grammar is not because people are, don't use the right fork and knife. It's not a mere matter of civility. It is a reflection of a displacement of the sense of responsibility. It's somebody's or not mine. Hopefully the school system will be better. If you say, I hope the school system, which is correct, will be better, the next question is, if you hope, what are you going to do about it? Secondarily, as the Austrian English philosopher Wittgenstein pointed out, hope is a very unusual word. 
we think of it in very complex ways. But one of the ways we think of it when we think of it in comparison to animals is it an emotion. I mean, we once asked a very classic philosophical question, what's the difference between humans and, and animals? You talk about your dog, your cat, and you say, well, my cat. Uh, does the cat, uh, cat is angry, that seems sensible. Cat is happy, cat is satisfied. Can you say about the cat that the cat hopes? I'm at a lecture at the National Academy of Wine. My cat is hoping that I'll come home with Purina Ketchup. Now, if you said that to your neighbor, the neighbor would say, mind stop and say that's a very odd thing to say. The dog hopes it'll be Central Park and not Bryant Park. <laughs> now, I ask the question, why does it sound funny? Well, one of his tentative notions in the second part of the philosophical investigations was to say that hope is contingent on the possession of a language. Only someone who can speak can hope. The reason the animal can't hope is because it does not possess a language. The metaphor that I read in that is that hope, which is what we always sort of wiggle back into as a retreat from any serious problem, is a function of language. Therefore, hope is not an emotion. Hope is contingent on education. If you think there's hope in the society, or there's hope for the future, it is contingent on the possession of a language. The hoper has to be able to speak. To broaden it in a more vulgar way, the hoper has to be educated. So if you think that there is hope for the society, it is contingent on education. And therefore, it is not some other domestic policy that we have to be concerned about with the deficit. It has a unique place. And the reason it does not in our political discourse is because of the anomalies of so-called local and non-national organization. But if there's anything the current administration can do, it's probably not health care. They'll fix that because they want to fix that, because Harris Wofford made it a big political issue, and because it sounds terrific. But America has a disease. People run around the block and eat good food and preserve their bodies, and their minds are totally empty. <laughs> they live longer for no apparent purpose. Now the point is, health care for what? Do I want to live longer and more healthily in a totalitarian society where there's no free speech because no one thinks and therefore no one has a dissenting opinion? Where intolerance is so enormous that we take any dissenting opinion as a, as a reason to hate the other person. Where language doesn't communicate anymore. Where no one has any memory. Where there is no shared knowledge, no shared experience, no shared discourse, and no, therefore, no democracy. Do I want my health care to be better? No, I prefer not to be insured. So at the center of the future of America will be education. And the sooner this administration, which are supposed to be the good people as opposed to the bad people, come up with a serious policy, the better off our children will be if we have a hope for them and we cease oppressing them with our own ill-earned pessimism. Thank you. I'm supposed to take questions, and the, the lighting in this place, oh, nah, that should have been from the beginning. This was not a performance, but a lecture. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions. So I understand this is an active audience. Yes. The question is on, on, the, on the role of vocational education. I would say that, um, in my view, I would not want to emulate the European system by which, at age 11 or 12, there is a real tracking. That I think we need to preserve common schooling in my system, uh, which would end, let's say, at um, uh, somewhere at age 15 or 14. In the community college, I think it's a very appropriate. I mean, I think what would be the second part of high school in the current system? Um, or even the last three years of high school, then yes. When, by the time the child goes over the early adolescent years, his 15 or 16, then it seems to me sensible. 15, perhaps. 
Well, I think that's community colleges have done a very good job. The community colleges, as you know, have a very mixed system. The community colleges, there are sort of so-called liberal arts components to it, and then there are vocational tracks in it, uh, uh, nursing, uh, um, various other kinds of um, uh, vocational tracks. So I think the community colleges actually have done a pretty good job in defining that. My criticism of their um, system is that they probably, given the current state of American high school education, have too little general education in those programs. In other words, what the, what's wrong now with the community college system is that it's based, American higher education is in trouble because it's like having a huge palace built on toothpicks. Henry Rosofsky, whom I greatly admire, the, the former dean of the arts and sciences at Harvard, is used to saying, is written in the New Republic and other places, that the American higher education system is the best in the world. Well, he's right, but there's a time lag. At some point, it's going to crumble because the infrastructure beneath it is bad. It's going to begin to deteriorate. It already has. The reason is because it can't, you can't have a terrible elementary and secondary school system and have a lousy, the Japanese education system probably will get better, although it's weak because their secondary and elementary school system is strong. So we're talking about <coughs> a time lag. In the current higher education system, I would say the vocational system uh, that um, vocational education that given the quality of high school preparation, probably that the, the, the vocational, particularly not so much even the community colleges in the so-called comprehensive state universities, not the main campuses, let's say of University of Michigan or University of Wisconsin, but the secondary campuses that are often teacher training schools expanded with other vocational tracks. There, the general education component, what I would call, what we call liberal arts component, is not, not strong enough. And it, it can't be detached. So if it's ethics in a nursing school, it has to be serious ethics, but using the occasion of medical issues to force the question. So I, 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 I'm quite allergic to proponents of the liberal arts that love the idea that learning is useless. And this, you know, that if you say, I, if, if a parent or a child says, well, will I get a job having contempt for the question? It's nonsense. If education is simply decorative and useless, why do it? The point is you want to transform the quality of someone's private life as well as their public life. Therefore, it has to be useful. I would argue that a serious, uh, once was asked at a forum in William and Mary, there was a public forum of, of terrible idea of a lot of college presidents on one platform. And, um, and the question from the audience, and a young woman came up and said, uh, uh, I uh, graduated philosophy, and I want to be a business person. I want to be successful in business. Should I go to business school? And uh, most of my colleagues said yes. And of course, in order to, most people were asleep. I figured I have, to be, I have to be put some humor in this. I said, listen, the worst thing you can do is business school. In fact, if you're any good in philosophy, you'll be a much better business person. Because in fact, if you know what you're doing, the philosophy training is the best because you'll do things that people don't expect. And uh, you won't sort of copy some kind of managerial nonsense uh, that someone is teaching you. And the worst thing you can do is to destroy your philosophical education by going to business school, stay away. Now, my point is only that's an exaggerated way of making a point. And the point is that uh, um, if you want to transform the quality of our professions, you have to have a much tougher, critical component in the teaching, and not simply teaching the rules of an existing professional cadre. But that, but I would say ideally there's no problem between, there's no inherent conflict between the vocational and the non-vocational, on the higher education level. But in the current system, it's a very tough question because it tant it's tantamount to tracking, which probably is not a bad idea, but the high schools are not doing a good job to begin with, the idea that uh, the vocational especially the older New York City situation where the definition of the vocation has changed dramatically. There are no jobs out there for these people. I mean, the printing trades, I mean, it used to be you know, much more stable job structure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question about the, uh, the minority is that clearly demography uh, is the determining factor. Uh, uh, as the demography of a, a specific area changes, the public school will reflect that demography. It seems to me, given the uncanny and desperate parallelism between poverty and race, the society has a clear obligation uh, to invest per capita much more 
in the inner city school uh, than is being invested now. In terms of curriculum, I would say there I'm interested in what works. You know, I'm not an expert in this area, and uh, it's not, you know, it, will in fact a, a Hispanic or child or Mexican American child or an African American child read more with more, with discover the real power of reading, how reading is different from television, how reading is different from other entertainments, if they read uh, material by um, by authors of their own ethnicity. If it works, do it. If it doesn't work, I would think, uh, I mean, my, I, I say this is a perverse way, but it's an important point, uh, you know, that uh, my eagerness to read might have been accelerated by, um, uh, by feeding me a lot of anti-Semitic literature. Uh, that is to say, I don't think that, um, I think that discovering the other is one of the magics of reading. One of the magic power of reading is learning about a secret world which is not your own. So the question has to be what motivationally works. Um, but race is the most significant issue in American society, um, although class and race are related, uh, especially for, for Jews of European origin. It's very hard for us to think of this because this is the first culture in which we are really the majority because it's not our religion, but the color of our skin that determines the real line. For all the difficulties of anti-Semitism, it's a triviality, because in Europe we were the primary minority. We came to the United States where we are not the primary minority. And uh, we are in fact now being majority middle class. There's no more Jewish working class to speak of. Uh, and the fact is that we are part of a, uh, of a middle class white majority. And that's not to criticize the Jewish community. Uh, far be it for me to criticize it. But the point is that uh, to recognize that there is not an easy analogy between ourselves as an immigrant group and the underclass uh, American, African American is to, uh, is to simply, the contrasts far outweigh any similarities. Yeah. Well, bilingual education. Uh, bilingual education, I would say, is, um, is again a matter of strategy. Uh, I'm not an expert in bilingual education. I would argue that the most important thing is to get a child to read in whatever language works and use that language effectively. Um, I do not consider that bilingual education is uh, an attack on the primacy of English. I think actually that true bilingual education uses both languages. And there are many examples of a great success in bilingual education uh, in countries where there are many languages, multi-languages, and sub-languages. In Spain and other areas, there is a lot of positive experience in the European uh, arena, particularly, where young people learn more than one language, to read and write one language with great ease. Uh, those of us who had, came from multilingual homes never spoke the wrong language to the wrong person, never were confused. And it has become a, put, a political football which defies. The real problem in many bilingual education is where there is illiteracy in two languages. And the question then is how, is how to solve that. And that's a motivational question I would defer to the experts. But to make it a political issue is nonsense. That is to say, oh, now everybody's worried about America, about English. Well, the fact remains is that in New York City in the turn of the century, uh, much of the population considers itself very American had very bad English and got all its information from German newspapers, Yiddish newspapers, Russian newspapers, Ukrainian newspapers, and suddenly, uh, when it's Spanish, we don't like it. The fact is that uh, English is the dominant language in the world, and the chance that some poverty-stricken Mexican-Americans are going to dethrone English is racism. And anybody, so the fact is I'm not offended by multilingual signs. I'm not offended by uh, bilingualism. Uh, that uh, uh, the American, the, the idea that human beings psychologically or cognitively can only know, know one language is a trivialization of the cognitive processes. So to do, it, to do it right is the issue, not to be against bilingual education. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Okay, uh, very good question. The question was uh, the analogy of baseball, which um, is a wonderful, I, or I owe it to John Searle, the great philosopher from Berkeley, who 
has used baseball analogies very well in philosophical discourse. Simply, let's use language. You, you're right on the money on this one. Child needs to discover that they can do something with written language they can't do by speaking. One of the first things is to communicate with somebody they don't see. So the first thing the child has to discover is, that is writing has to be public, not private. You write to the teacher. I don't care about the teacher. I never liked the teacher. I never liked any teacher I had. I wrote to them under duress. And so therefore, the question is, can I communicate in a way I can't communicate? What's the power of writing? That you can read something and without knowing the person or hearing the person or seeing the person. So it's a magic of communication and the power of that communication and the response you get. So number one, you have to make the writing public from the very beginning. Two, you have to have the gratification of the response of what is communicated without, before you correct the form. Right? When a kid practices baseball, right, they're hitting the ball, and the parent or the coach encourages them right, to make contact with the ball, whether it's foul or, right? The more they can coordinate and hit the ball, then you can, then you can say, okay, don't hit it, you know, try to direct the traffic of the ball so it's in the baseline. Same with grammar. Once the kid gets a gratification of how it feels to actually express him or herself, to discover that they have ideas they do not have. The difference between writing and speaking is that by, by writing, you discover what you think. By speaking, you're just testing it out. That's why people think, pardon my language, that it's bullshit. But if you actually sit down and write it and you look at it and it bounces back, you say, oh my God, how could I say such a thing? then you discover what you really think. And in fact, in the process of writing, you have ideas you never had. The idea that we were taught, got to have your ideas all worked out, figure them out, and then you put them on a piece of, no wonder people had writing block. <laughs> Especially with a computer now, where editing is easy, the fact is, when you start to write, you eventually get your idea, your idea of form, you discover you, anybody who writes, I do a lot of writing, so I'm not talking about something I don't know anything about. In fact, anybody who writes knows that they revise. Why do they revise? Because in the process of writing, they started out from this point and ended up in that point. The child needs that gratification, and you can teach that gratification. And there are very many techniques that are now very effective in doing that from elementary school. But one of the most important things is the pride, the public recognition. Communicating with other kids, doing it in groups. We think writing is a private act. Well, anybody who writes knows it's not a private act. I write it, I send it to an editor, the editor sends it back to me, writes it up, I send it to somebody else, what do they think about it? I'm not doing a closet and jumping out full blown. But we teach writing as a private thing, every kid with his or her notebook. Johnny, read your story. Susie, read your story. Or whatever. Also, you don't teach, again, fill in the blank. Match column A with column B. Blank paper. Blank paper. I didn't, you have to speak a little slower. Say it again. There's a problem in the school system. Right. Well, th this, this is an interesting question. The questioner asks, uh, how, do you, how do you change or, or intervene when people are segmented by their own performance? They've been failed in first grade, and second grade, and third grade. How do we, how do, we do this? First of all, the one thing that I, I want to say in general is that we have confused speed of learning with quality. Very important thing. Uh, one of the things I didn't say about testing, which brings up by your discussion, is that we time tests. It is very stupid. There is, a, there is no evidence, in my judgment, that how rapidly someone learns something is correlative with how well they end up knowing it. So the speed of learning is a terrible, destructive thing. Uh, the person with the answer first got to be the smartest kid. The answer is no. That's why in teaching of science is catastrophic, because 
slow uptake is tantamount to stupidity. The kid who can do mathematics for whatever reason without needing to be taught is the definition of the gifted kid. Whereas the kid who actually would benefit from serious teaching explanation is considered a dummy because they're slow. They don't get it the first time. Well, I think maybe some wisdom in not getting it the first time. You follow me? So it seems to me that the rates of learning, especially with computers now, we are much, I think, able to measure them. Clearly, you raise a very important problem. My theory would be that if you raise the general standard, the minimum standard is honorable. What I'm saying, what now is the minimum standard is not honorable. If you raise the minimum standard, that is to say, give a musical analogy. If Heifetz is the top, being at the bottom of the class might be pretty good. In other words, it's respectable. Take, it, take the notion of, of literacy in religious contexts. That I actually can read the word of God and think about it is a sufficient minimum. I don't have to be a theologian. So what now, f doing poorly, so-called failure, is an impossible situation because the minimum standard of passage is so low that there is no incentive. If you raise the floor, then the quality of being at the bottom is not so terrible. Also, if you organize a school well, in my judgment, you can do a fair amount of interaction between the, the, the best and the worst. That is to say, I do believe at a young age that, uh, as in any other group, the very best can be helpful to the very least. And therefore, you can, one of the reasons I'm against tracking is because the mixed classroom can be very productive for both. Not because I'm a little livered liberal. Also, if you do track all the bright kids together, they develop a false bell-shaped curve, which is one of the tragedies of places like Harvard or MIT. Someone is very bright, sees that someone's brighter and decides they're stupid. Well, that's a distortion and a tragic distortion. There's always somebody smarter. Why should that bother you? That has to do with the perverseness of competitiveness. Yeah. Yeah, the reform of financing, I would simply, um, I would make it a, a major portion of the federal budget. I'm not of the view that the deficit is the primary political concern. Uh, that, um, uh, not that the deficit is not something that ultimately has to be, but I think there are many economists have made the very good argument that it's problematic as it, is, it, as it is. And clearly would be nice as an exchange for other expenditures, but it clearly has to be, in my judgment, a federal pass through to the states and to the local communities. That is to say, uh, not a bureaucracy, but some kind of uh, revenue sharing taxation, either through the kind of value added tax or either additional taxation or redistribution of current tax dollars. That is a straight federal, cannot be done without the federal government as the tax levy, directly from income tax, corporate tax, and uh, general broad-based taxes. Uh, no nation in the country does it, no in the world does it otherwise. And uh, it's simply America is trapped in this nonsense, 18th century nonsense, uh, which um, is, is a terrible thing in the financing side. Local control, local school boards, I mean, I think, you know, it's the last bastion of democracy is voting down a school budget. That's the last place Americans still feel empowered. I can go and put a ballot box and, and condemn the kids to ignorance. And I feel like I've really, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the heir of Thomas Jefferson and Abigail Adams. I mean, that's nonsense. Just because we, are, we feel powerless in all other walks of life, the Pentagon, Bosnia, healthcare, you know, that's out of our reach. We take all our vicious resentment about the absence of democratic power out on the school budget. Not in New York City so much because New York City is, the cities are a little bit more different, but in most of the, of the counties, and districts in the country, that's the case. So that's the way I would do it. It's simple minded, uh, but basic tax levy support. Yeah. In the community colleges, basically, furthermore, there's a, there's a massive shift in the presumption of adulthood. In the community college, the student for whatever illusion, considers him or herself actively engaged in going to something that treats them as an adult, much more than high school. 
Two, there is the professional organization of community college, which is borrowed not from the elementary school, but from the university. There are departments, a field, the people, the teachers feel themselves they're important people. They go to a dinner party and say, I'm a college teacher. What? A dinner party and say, I'm a high school teacher, fe. You know? Uh, well, that's the nature of American snobbery. So that's a tremendous, the whole environment is different. The attitude of the professional people in the whole, the way the day is scheduled. It's a course catalog, looks like a, like a college. I take courses, I register. Who registered for high school? Re you know, do you, you follow me? The whole thing is infantilizing. The American high school is an infantilizing prison. Nonsensical. Both at the high end and the low end. The high end, the kids try to get out as quickly as possible, take AP courses, which the people are not qualified to teach most of the time, or get out early. I mean, it's nonsense. It, it's, it's simply an outdated. I'm not against schooling. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not Ivan Illich. Forget about it. I'm not for de schooling society. I would like to send people to school for longer in the long run as adults as well. But, but it seems to me that. Uh, especially since culture is so professionalized, university increasingly is the only sort of place for, it supports the arts and culture. University has become excessively important in my society out of default. Um, but so adult education, people who are retired, going back to school, it's all wonderful. But um, I think the community college has, had, has better luck and would have better luck. Discipline problems, it's really, there really is a sense of self-discipline much fewer violence problems in the, in the, in the community colleges than in, in high schools. And it's not only the age group. I would drop compulsory schooling by two years. The kids are biologically that way. They're sexually active at a much earlier age. They're roaming around at a much earlier age. It just it doesn't work. It's not sensible, not sensible. And also individual choice, what am I studying? Much more individual choice. It's a much larger menu. Curiosity, genuine curiosity. What I find more desperate than anything else, we have very bright students, is what I would call detached ability. Good student who is a student in a mechanical way. That is to say, uh, dutiful, gifted, but there is no real genuine curiosity. So either we're looking for the existence of curiosity much more than tested ability, in my judgment, real curiosity, and the ability to nurture curiosity. The other thing I would say that I'm very convinced by is the work by several psychologists that uh, the ability uh, to spend time alone, the ability to actually to concentrate. So motivation and concentration are the two th things that I look for most in a student. Yeah. Well, the closest I ever got to this administration was in the 1988 campaign when Dukakis was running. Uh, Bill Clinton and I were on a McNeil-Lair uh, panel. Of course, he was by satellite in Arkansas debating Bill Bennett um, uh, in the Bush-Dukakis election, a uh, lost cause from the moment it started. Um, in any event, no. The, look, uh, the fact is that um, um, the political process is not really adept at admitting outsiders. And anybody with a real serious conscience in this business, being a politician is, is professional. I mean, people, very gifted people, Donna Shalala, who is here at Hunter College, these people, you know, have their entire life is devoted to arriving in Washington and getting ahead and so on and so on. And that's greatly to be admired. Mr. Clinton is to be admired for that. His ambition is one of the most things that recommends him. Um, and, uh, and so forth and so on. But, um, you know, education is, they have so many problems which are mandated that education, you know, you can blame somebody else. I'm equally critical of the governor of the state, who was a liberal Democrat, too. I think that, uh, frankly, the governor's record in education is an extremely disappointing matter, and that's his primary responsibility. And, in fact, in higher education, thank God for the Republicans in, this, in the state Senate. Oddly enough, uh, uh, it's always I feel a bad conscience having to vote for them. But without them, we would be in real trouble. 
you know, in the names of fiscal responsibility. I mean, it, it's, 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 like, it's, like a, it's like a satire, Kafkaesque satire. People can't read and write. Nothing is going on in the schools, and they're talking about, you know, balancing budgets and, and having opinions about everything uh, that's not relevant and worrying about whether they're going to run for this or run for that. And uh, the place is dying around them. I mean, it's tragic. Uh, whether or not the Clinton administration actually will do something serious in the way they've made a hoopla about, about um, I, I've, I had high hopes because the Governor Clinton was reputed to be very concerned about education when he was governor in Arkansas. And it seems nothing seems to have, I mean, this national service thing is very nice, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's like when somebody talks about his or her clothing, you know, it's about the bow tie. Well, the bow tie is not essential. The basic clothing is. And, um, and uh, that's part of the problem. Uh, uh, it's very disappointing. But I, it's early. And um, it's early. And uh, I still hope. But, they, they, you know, politicians are politicians. And politicians and serious education reform have never mixed, no matter what political stripe you're from. What I'm angry about the Republicans is they politicized education as a kind of part of the arsenal of neoconservatism. Had no business being inciting people against other people, blaming them for what happened in the school. Tragic, horrible, insulting, and not true. Yeah. This anti-intellectual quality, it's a good question. I'm not sure. I think one of the good things about Clinton and Gore is that they are at least president and vice president with a clear commitment and debt to education. In other words, I, their taste in music is a little bit of a disappointment, I have to say. Uh, uh, and, and, and from a musical point of view, the inauguration was a catastrophe. But, um, but I, do think, I do think what is, and they have yet to, to as, point someone to the arts, but Apart from that uh, disputable lack, um, the, these are, are individuals with a real commitment to their own higher education and to the power of education, as opposed to uh, President Reagan, who I, you know, it was hard to know what residue from college there was, and um, Quayle, who made a profession out of being dumb and doing poorly, and Bush, who really, who was, uh, I think, the residue of Yale was sort of a club. It was one other country club which he had walked through. These guys actually have a real commitment, uh, I think in a serious way, to what education did for them, whether it's Georgetown or Harvard or Oxford and so on and so on. And therefore, I think they're a good antidote to anti-intellectualism. The other thing that has, that the real anti-intellectualism is in the conflict between secular and the sacred, what I started with, in other words. The real anti-intellectualism is in religious belief, in fanaticism that says, if you're right, if I'm right, you can't be right too. In other words, the real problem, and that's in the abortion debate and all the other debates, is that people in the, in the United States have lost the sense that the Founding Fathers believed in, that you could believe in something deeply and absolutely without imposing it on the next person. If I tolerate someone else to have an abortion, I'm then complicit with murder. Therefore, I have to stop you. Now, this kind of generalization of absolute beliefs, because if I don't stop you, then I'm really not really, I'm not a real believer. So the kind of fundamentalist fanaticism is really the real anti-intellectualism. Don't bother me with the facts. I know the truth. So there's no discussion anymore. Now, that is the real. On the other side, we have become extremely committed to expertise. Everybody's an expert. So Bosnia, call an expert. Uh, healthcare, call an expert. Common sense is insufficient. So in a way, we're not so much intellectuals, we're very much married now to credentialing. No one believes anybody unless you're an expert. There is no, you know, how can you talk about it? Where are your credentials? So in a way, the intellectualism has been to some extent, um, the, the time of the autodidact is gone. The only nostalgia one should have for Truman is, I think he really liked classical music, and um, <laughs> as much as he liked his daughter, but also that, uh, that he was an autodidact. You know, it's interesting that one of the, some of the best and most wonderful people are people who've not learned through schooling, but learned by themselves, which most people learn anyway. Schooling is only an instrument to help people learn, teach themselves. 
But in fact, that, that uh, we now require credentials, and uh, therefore there is less anti-intellectualism, I would say, in American society now than has existed of the old kind. What has replaced it is the sectarianism, in which dissent is not tolerated. It's one of the ironies that uh, we have forgotten how to disagree without turning to forms of violence, insult, or actual physical violence. Yeah. Sure. Right. Right. The, yeah, the questioner asks two questions. One is whether I'm a believer in so-called the theory of learning by doing, and I think that's the, the first part of the question by the baseball analogy, and secondarily whether I, um, I, I'm in favor of the sort of service learning idea, which is of people going out into the field and actually using uh, the knowledge. First of all, on the learning by doing, um, clearly the trick is when experience is insufficient. The real task in teaching is when observation is insufficient in the ordinary sense. Take the earth is round idea. Or does the, or, or the Copernican as opposed to the Ptolemaic idea that in fact the earth is not the center of, uh, that, that things don't revolve around us but we revolve around the sun and so forth and so on. And these kinds of things. Then one has to rethink the question of observation. Other kinds of inductive issues where you learn something that's counterintuitive. The toughest things to learn are counterintuitive things, whether it's negative numbers or whether it's things like calculus and so, which are not, which are sometimes not explicable entirely by experience. But in the early stages, discovering how you would solve a problem to get an answer, even if it's part of the enjoyment. And um, that's, so I think all learning has to be active and have to have immediate reward. The service learning thing is, is very important, but here again, in a way, the enemy is, the power of journalistic, the, all the question of the sound bite and all that, is the thing that we don't tolerate well, our ambiguity and complexity. And that's the hardest thing to teach. That, that things are complex, and they don't always, can't be reduced, and that some things are ambiguous, some things, and one of the toughest things, certainly in an experiential way, is to tolerate the idea that, that a, an answer is provisional and might be upset by something that's discovered or thought about later, or you might change your mind. Experiential learning is terrific. Uh, my view, however, is that since I'm concerned about people's willingness to spend time alone to read, I don't think there's a surrogate for reading and writing. I don't think television can teach. Television can entertain, it cannot teach. It's not connected to memory. Therefore, it seems to me that the only difficult is that students are very, young people are very much in the world, uh, that the contemplative dimension is where we need to have real encouragement, uh, which, is, which is not experiential, really. Um, also, some, a lot of experience can be overwhelming. What, what is very difficult in, in education is to overcome the sense of powerlessness. Show me the poverty of the Bronx. I say, well, what, what am I going to do about it? You know, what can I do? Uh, AIDS, what can I do? Well, clearly there's something that can be done. Uh, but the sense of the risk-reward, if you overwhelm the young person with the sort of magnitude of it, then the reaction is passivity. Nothing about the baseball, the rule is clear, and the, you know, there's, a, there's a chance to get onto first base. It's not a home run. And when you throw people, the experience learning is a very complicated issue, but basically a good idea. But it has to be complemented with time alone. I'll take two more questions, and then I think you've been patient enough. Um, I'll take this gentleman here and the woman there. If you really have a very important question, <laughs> being a college graduate, I, I can talk endlessly. I'll wear you all out. Yes. One and two. Yeah. You know, I think this private school issue is an interesting one. Uh, when Bill Clinton, child, went to private school, um, I, 
instead of every sort of the liberal reaction, how can he do that? What he should have done, in my judgment, said, I've looked at the Washington school system, and I've been outside. I've just come to Washington. I've discovered that I can't send my child to the public school because it doesn't meet my standards. Therefore, I'm submitting a, sending my child to private school, and I'm submitting a bill to the Congress to massively improve so that future presidents and people who come to Washington don't face this dilemma. I don't blame any middle class person who says I cannot send my children to public schools. What if there were a real will to improve the schools, then in the free market they would return back to the public schools. So it seems to me you have to separate the middle class interest in the public schools from whether they send their children there. So it seems to me that that uh, I think the way you can interest the middle class in public schooling is self-interest. Every middle class value is at risk by the failure of the public schools. Economic self-interest, safety, quality of life, it's all at risk. Uh, even something as trivial as whether this house is filled when there's a concert here. Public education doesn't improve. If we don't have serious education in the arts, there won't be an audience, or much less of an audience. So anything we care about is contingent on education, and there is no argument that could understand that better than the middle class. If you could convince aristocrats like Jefferson to be interested in public education, it's trivial to convince the middle class. In other words, it seems to me that I think it's, not, it's an easy argument. The real question is, however, given the pressure on, on people uh, who are the so-called senior citizen population in many districts, the people who do not have children, the middle class who do not have children or grown up, uh, that's why the property tax base has to be abandoned, because they feel pressured uh, in terms of the expenditures. And that's the more difficult matter. But I, I, I think that, uh, that the middle class can be interested in public school. Uh, uh, that's why they moved to suburbia after all. Uh, so I, I, think it's, I think it's a doable proposition. I happen to think, someone asked about politics, I think that the Clinton administration is missing a big, a big opportunity. Even Bush tried to invent himself as education president because he understood, as did Reagan, that this is an issue which can galvanize the American public of all races and of all genders and of all ages. Now, why they don't mystifies me. Americans are much more interested in the educational system than they are in Bosnia if they really believe someone would do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is where some of you asked about the anti-intellectualism, the question about the role of the arts. Uh, this is a tough subject because I happen to think that the aesthetic dimension is crucial to the others. That is to say, to the conduct of science, um, to uh, politics and so forth and so on. I believe there's a relationship between art and other, between the aesthetic and the ethical, the aesthetic and the epistemological and so forth and so on. So I think uh, arts education has been an integral part of elementary school life. It can't be what we have passed for art education, which is, you know, eight turkeys at Thanksgiving colored in in the same brown color. Better no art education at all. Um, the same is the music education. When I see what goes on in the public school, high school bands, I would abandon an instrument too. Uh, so it seems to me that improvisation, composition, re I mean, what we would call real use of the art forms has to be nurtured very early. Um, the abandonment of the arts is in, in the New York City school system, for example, is a tragedy of un, un massive. That was one of the few things actually the schools did very well comparatively. And um, it is, um, it, it, but that's where the Amer American anti intellectualism is profound. I mean, the administration has yet to name the head of the National Endowment for the Arts. It shows what they think of the thing. In other words, that uh, they've been slow in appointments in general, but it, you know, that's. The downside of appointing the wrong person is very slim anyway. Um, so it, 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 it's a very, it's a, it's a problem. There is where Americans think, well, the arts are a luxury, a decorative. Um, and they aren't. And um, they, uh, they're important public arenas for 
groups to exchange views, to express themselves, to meet, and uh, to make a, the quality of life uh, meaningful, serious. Meaningful is a bad word, but serious. And it's an important experience in terms of your question about doing, uh, using language, uh, color, and creation uh, for a child is terribly important in terms of the gratification question as well. Uh, so um, uh, I'm the last person to argue that arts is peripheral. Part of the use of the arts has to be that it has to be integrated in the other teaching. In other words, that it can't be simply segmented out. Uh, uh, that um, uh, Because kids always understand the difference. In other words, and when you teach reading, there's no reason you can't connect reading to painting. You can't read reading to music uh, or to theater or, or to um, dance. Language is the instrument in which we communicate about the arts. So you see a dance performance, you describe it, use language. You react to music, you use language. You react to painting, you talk about it. So in terms of the motivation of literacy, the arts are crucial. They're not a surrogate. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.